Welcome, everybody. My name is Brendan Edwards. I am the curator of rare books and special collections at W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections at the Queen's University Library. On behalf of the exhibition team, uh, let me begin by acknowledging that Queen's University is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to live, learn, and play as uninvited guests upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nation. Acknowledging this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies and migrations of peoples from around the globe to this place. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. This territory is included in the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community, as well as First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. I'm very pleased that you could join us for a reboot of The Little Wanderers, a literary history of British home children in Canada. I've called this exhibition a reboot because in March, 2020, it was very nearly ready to launch when the global pandemic changed everything. Adapting to this new reality, uh, the curators and exhibition team pivoted to reimagine this exhibition as a virtual exhibition but we're thrilled that we've also been able to restage it in person as originally planned. Before I introduce the two people who were the impetus for this project, I'd like to also acknowledge my colleagues here at WD Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections, as this was a truly collaborative effort. Let me thank my colleagues, Kim Bell, Daniela Cruz, Ken Herndon, and especially Natasha Krismatovich and Jacques Talbot, who are the magicians behind mounting the materials in our cases. Let me now introduce the curators of this show. Dr. S. Brooke Cameron is Associate Professor in the Department of English. Dr. Cameron's research focuses on gender and economic themes in the 19th century and end of the century literature. Alicia Alves is a PhD candidate in the Department of English. Alicia's research interests are in gender and sexuality, animals and animality, Childhood Studies, Victorian Literature, and Children's Literature. Thank you very much, Brooke and Alicia, for all your efforts in bringing this exhibition to fruition and for your talk today on Little Wanderers, A Literary History of the British Home Children in Canada. Thank you so much for inviting us to share our research on this fascinating chapter in Canadian history. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. In honor of the home children, and specifically those whose voices were silenced or whose stories were lost, we would like to begin with an excerpt from a letter by a home child who lived in Kingston. Dear friend, it gives me great joy from year to year to hear of so many poor children who are sheltered under these roofs, which is the delight of that dear old country called Scotland. We look back with loving memories to the nice time we used to have on Christmas and all the other amusements. Christmas is very dull in Kingston, except for the big dinner. There are lots of geese and turkey, plum pudding, and so forth. I am in a very nice place and I like it very much. Everyone is so good to me. I have a great many friends here, but I have one that stitches closer than a brother as the words of the scripture goes, seek ye first in the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Your loving girl, B.R. Before I begin, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to this project. As introduced, I specialize in 19th century literature with a particular interest in Victorian class and labor. In my research on Victorian labor, I started to notice references to the home children. Some of the texts I read, like R.M. Ballington, Ballington's Dusty Diamonds, Margaret Harkness's In Darkest London, or Hespa Stretton's Lost Jip, 
referenced Victorian social reformers Mariah Rye and Annie McPherson and their transatlantic migration schemes. This led me down a research rabbit hole, so to speak, in which I discovered the history of the home children who were, according to these reformers anyway, sent to Canada in search of a better life. Annie McPherson and Mariah Rye were the first to begin sending the home children overseas in 1869, but they were later joined by even bigger figures such as Dr. Thomas John Bernardo, who also sent children to Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. There were during this period as many as 44 different salvation agencies in operation. Approximately 118 children came to Canada through these organizations until the or operation was finally terminated in 1932. McPherson was responsible for sending 14,000 children to Canada, while Rye and Bernardo migrated another 5,000 and 35,000, respectively. Most of these children were between the ages of 6 and 17, but some were as young as 2 and some as old as 18. So I found myself wondering, who were these children? Or what were the social situations from which they came from or were rescued? from by these reformers. Why send these children to Canada? In other words, why not reform at home? Why was the transatlantic migration the answer to these larger socioeconomic problems? These questions subsequently inspired a SHRC or a Social Science Humanities Research Council Insight Development Grant funded project, a two-year project in which I, with Alicia Alves, worked closely with W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections, looking into the literary and cultural history behind the migration scheme. We asked ourselves, how was such a scheme normalized by the literature and cultural texts of the period, specifically Victorian reform writings, 19th century children's literature, like adventure fiction, and literature on or about the home children. To answer these questions, we work closely with the library's special collections of 19th century and early 20th century literature, especially the Canadiana and children's literature collections. But you will also see on display texts drawn from the library's stunning collection of Bibles, as well as several texts in case five on the home children purchased specifically by the library for this exhibition. We were lucky enough to tour the special collection and to physically see what books were in our area of interest, such as in the children's literature collection and in the Canadian literature collection. And then working with staff at special collections then meant that we could discover texts we might not have otherwise found that enriched our examination of the British home children and specifically our ex examination of adventure in Canada. I will begin the talk today with a condensed discussion of what I found working with 19th century texts on the cultural situation back in England, focusing on Victorian social reform writings. Alicia and I will then both talk to you about 19th century children's literature. And then finally, we will conclude with a closer look at late Victorian literature, specifically about the home children in Canada. The first case, or back to the context. The Victorian period witnessed the rise of the Industrial Revolution and with it, the mass migration of people into overcrowded cities in search of scarce and poorly paid work. The Long Depression, 1873 to 1896, made it even harder to find work and provide for families. Out of work and desperate, many families were driven to the workhouse run by local and underfunded parishes, where they were forced to perform punitive labor, like picking oakum or breaking rocks in exchange for a meal and a bed for the night. Even worse off were the poor children, sometimes forced by circumstances, like parents being sent to the workhouses, to seek shelter from the extremely limited number of sources. It was in response to this environment that several independent charity organizations emerged, including Annie McPherson's Home of Industry, the Salvation Army, and Dr. Bernardo's Homes, all looking to uplift the children out of poverty. 
It bears mentioning that these texts, and indeed the vast majority of writings on economic problems in the 19th century, took a very cruel approach to poverty, often blaming individuals for their economic misfortune, rather than look at social factors like poor wages and lack of job security. This so-called individualist approach thus made it seem completely reasonable to send poor and working class children overseas to Canada, sometimes even without parents' consent. And so this is one of the first texts we looked at, Charles Booth's The Labour and Life of the People. Charles Booth's intensive multi-volume study drew on new sociological methods and statistics in particular, in order to categorize and map the working class and poor populations of London at the end of the 19th century. Booth used this data to create eight distinct classes, ranging from A, the lowest class of occasional laborers, loafers, and semi-criminals, to H, upper middle class. Booth also used the data to create color-coded maps of London with black areas marking those parts with the highest concentration of poverty. Pictured here on your right is a detail of the old nickel from the map of East London, the pullout in volume one, showing many areas marked in darker colors and several pockets of almost pure black. The bottom map shows what the old nickel looked like after slum clearances the often forcible removal of its poorest residents and note the decline in the black coating in that second version in the bottom right. Booth himself was a proponent of social reformers like Dr. Bernardo who, off, who claimed to rescue poor and working class children from the streets. On pages 38 to 39, as part of a discussion on class A, the worst of the poor, Booth mentions Dr. Bernardo's home as a refuge for these street children or street Arabs as he calls them. And on page 127, in a discussion of institutions, Booth again speaks highly of Dr. Bernardo's social interventions on behalf of these street children. William Booth, not to be confused with Charles Booth, was a Methodist preacher and along with his wife, Catherine, founded the Salvation Army in 1865. In Darkest England was his popular treatise outlining the Salvation Army's mission to save the submerged tents, as they called them, that part of the population living in permanent poverty. As suggested by its title in Darkest England, the book relies upon racial tropes in order to characterize the urban poor as distinct from their upper class counterparts. Booth was a firm believer in immigration and proposed removing the poor to farm colonies outside of the city, as you can see in the map here, to the British colonies, such as Canada. The book's pullout map here charts this multi-step approach to immigration. At the bottom, you see the submerged tents, and then to the farm colonies, and then eventually outward to the, the colonies like Canada at the very top. So moving on to case two or formative texts. The second case in this exhibit on the next part of this history focuses on what we called formative texts. Many of the home children who made their way across the Atlantic often felt that their journey was a spiritual one. This outlook was instilled in them by the rescue societies. Indeed, most pioneers of the migration schemes were motivated by religious notions of conversion and salvation. These reformers thus mandated religious education alongside skills training as preparation for migration. So for this part of the project then, Alicia and I looked at the library's collection of rare Bibles. You will see in case two stunning examples of an illuminated family Bible there on the left, complete with prayer cards and a notice regarding Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, as well as the incredibly precious teeny tiny thumb Bible there on your right. And it's much smaller than it appears on the screen. At the same time, we looked at how these religious themes made their way into literature of the period, especially children's adventure fiction. Working closely with the library's special collection of children's literature, we considered how formative texts in this tradition, like Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, 
helped to lay the groundwork for the Victorian view of migration as a spiritual transformation. Indeed, the 19th century witnessed an explosion of so-called Robinson Aids, which paired global adventure with spiritual conversion. And still other 19th century authors, such as Hespa Stratton and Horatio Alger, appealed to readers' Christian sensibilities in their sympathetic representation of poor and orphan children. These authors stressed the necessity of moral reform, if not outright Christian conversion, in saving the young outcast. So the third case in the exhibit looks at children's adventure fiction. But before I move on to talk more about children's adventure fiction, I will first begin with a bit about how I came to work on this project. So I have been working with Dr. Brooke Cameron for the past approximately two years on this project on home children in Canada and also on other projects as well. So my research interests are centered in British children's literature, specifically during the late Victorian and Edwardian periods. In my doctoral research, I look at texts such as Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, and Frances Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden. While my work focuses on representations of childhood and animals in texts such as these, I'm also interested in children's and young adult literature more broadly. Since much of my work focuses on children's literature, my work with Dr. Cameron on this project about the home children has similarly focused on children's texts related to this topic. Our research has explored how children's literature fits into this child migration scheme and the ways in which this children's literature supports and even normalizes sending children to the colonies and specifically, of course, to Canada. In doing research on this topic, we have been reading through classic children's adventure fiction and also children's adventure fiction set in Canada in order to examine the ways in which children's migration and adventures are depicted in these texts as advantageous both to the British Empire and also to children themselves. In this part of today's talk, I will discuss some examples of these adventure stories. So while reading the adventure stories, some questions we considered were, why did social reformers look to child migration as an appropriate solution for poverty? What was it about colonial relocation that made sense to these rescue workers? Influenced by formative works such as Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, published in 1719, Popular Victorian adventure stories often blend together the idea of colonialism and Christian enlightenment. Reformers would have had such stories in mind when they thought about relocating children in the colonies to work and would have envisioned migration as an act of salvation, saving souls and spreading English values throughout the colonies. And in this way, migration to Canada could similarly be seen as adventure in this context. While the texts I will later discuss as examples include girls in the adventure, which is important because girls were also sent to Canada, it is important to note that much of the popular adventure stories of the time, so particularly by those popular writers such as R.M. Ballantyne, H. Ryder Haggard, G.A. Henty, and Captain Frederick Marianne, focus on boys as the protagonists. And so many of these texts also tend to support British Empire, colonialism, and imperialism, as we will see. I do want to quickly note, though, that case three does include two of these books that bring girls into the adventure narrative and so that um, aspect of colonialism as well, uh, including Elizabeth Whitaker's Robina Crusoe and L.T. Mead's Four on an Island. I will, however, be focusing on two of the more popular examples of adventure fiction, and both examples follow male protagonists. So R.M. Ballantyne was one of the best known children's adventure authors of the Victorian period. During his lifetime, he produced over a hundred works, many of them published serially. His Coral Island, pictured here, for instance, served as the inspiration for William Golding's The Lord of the Fly. Whereas Ballantyne's text illustrates Ralph, Jack, and uh, Peterkin's adventures after they're shipwrecked on an island in a way that supports empire. So again, positioning the English boys in opposition to or as saviors of the indigenous people on the island. Golding's novel is more cynical and illustrates the boys' relationships breaking down in violent ways after the boys are shipwrecked. Valentine's Coral Island blends religion and adventure, and again also supports empire and colonialism, as the boys act as kind of missionaries on the island. Captain Frederick Marriott, popular for his sea adventure stories in particular, also wrote about Canadian adventure, 
such as in the settlers in Canada, which I will discuss later for case four. Mr. Midshipman Easy, though, pictured here, follows Jack Easy's adventures at sea. We see how the sea calls to him and how eager he is to go on the adventure. The novel also illustrates Jack's struggles with his father's belief in the equality between all men, which Jack actually comes to disagree with. So Jack's family is wealthy enough that he doesn't actually need to go to sea. He does so specifically for the adventure of it. Jack travels to many countries, especially around the Mediterranean, and he has many adventures with storms at sea and also fights with other men, as we see in this image. And so while Jack does not actually need to go to sea for monetary reasons, the novel focuses on Jack's yearning for adventure away from home. So the fourth case in the exhibit focuses on adventure in Canada specifically. Alongside the more traditional forms of adventure fiction, there was also a growing number of adventure stories or children's stories set in Canada. Many of these stories focus on the potential dangers of the wilderness, either for a settler family or for adult or child characters separately. For instance, some of the texts we have read for our research regarding Canadian adventure texts include the threat of wild animals or of getting lost or injured in the wilderness. These narratives also include texts in which families immigrate to Canada, usually from England, and detail the family's hard labor, but also the potential for success and wealth in Canada. However, it is important to note that many of the texts also include stereotypes of Indigenous peoples as part of the adventure narrative, and also we see the ways in which many of the texts uphold British colonialism and specifically settler colonialism. Similar to the Victorian adventure fiction I mentioned earlier, some of the texts also portray gendered experiences of adventure by showing the boys hunting and navigating the wilderness while the girls are engaged in domestic labor. But some texts such as Marriott's The Settlers in Canada also portray the girls as needing to learn necessarily survival skills such as learning how to shoot. While many writers portrayed Canada as a place to rebuild or to gain wealth, they also depicted the country as a place of adventure and hard work. Frederick Marriott's novel, The Settlers in Canada, follows an English family, along with their adopted orphan nieces, who relocates to Canada in the 1790s in order to rebuild their wealth. Marriott's novel combines an emigration story with adventure for both boys and girls, since girls must also learn to shoot for their protection, but also their enjoyment. Despite primarily focusing on the benefits of moving to Canada to gain wealth and to combat criminality and poverty in England, as the novel suggests, this novel also details the dangers of doing so and includes repeated concerns about whether or not it is the right decision to move to Canada because of the potential dangers. Catherine Partrail, who moved from England to Canada herself, set many of her writings in or around or refers to the region that is now known as Ontario. Trail's novel, Canadian Crusoes, supports the idea that the adventure to be found in Canada was for both boys and girls. Trail's novel tells the story of siblings and friends who become lost after going out into the woods. These children learn wilderness skills in order to survive and must work together during their adventure. Although the boys have a bigger role in navigating the Canadian landscape than Catherine does, her domestic skills prove useful in the wilderness. The novel draws on earlier survival stories, such as Robinson Crusoe again, and demonstrates how domestic skills such as sewing are also useful for surviving in the wilderness. So this text then offers another example of how English girls can also find and take part in adventure in Canada. This then takes us to the final part of our talk, case five, literature specifically about the home children. This is the heart of the project, or rather, the history we have traced all leads to this, the often forcible shipment of over 100,000 children from their homes and or family in the United Kingdom to sometimes chilly reception in Canada. For this part of the project, we worked closely with Jordan Library's services coordinator, Kim Bell, who purchased several items, especially for this exhibit, including the copy of Abundance Grace, containing an essay or memoir by Annie McPherson. An evangelical missionary, McPherson began her work with the poor and destitute youth of London by writing exposés of exploitative labor practices. And in 1869, she founded her home of industry at Commercial Street in Spitalfields. McPherson's home of industry functioned as both recruiting and training station, prepping its young wards for a new life in the colony. 
Children were introduced to Bible studies, as well as basic skills deemed necessary for life in Canada. These children were then sent to McPherson's receiving homes in Belleville, Ontario, Galt, Ontario, and Knowlton, Quebec, and then on to foster families in the rural countryside. The library also purchased these stunning copies of Our Darlings and also Bubbles magazine. Thomas John Bernardo was an Irish philanthropist who trained in medicine at the London Hospital. Though he never took his degree, he still went by doctor. In the 1860s, he focused his attention on poor children of East London, working as preacher in the ragged schools. He founded Bernardo's Home in 1867 and eventually established numerous other children's shelters. Bernardo eventually became interested in the home children migration scheme after he realized that support within England was in short supply. He set up his first distribution home in Canada in 1884, Hazelbray in Peterborough, Ontario. And in an effort to promote his rescue work, Bernardo published a number of serials for children these serials, like our darlings and bubbles here, contain stories that celebrated children's adventure and reformation. These works were essentially a kind of propaganda for Bernardo's charity work and migration scheme. You will also see in the case Bernardo's Kidnapped, a narrative of fact, as he calls it, published in 1885. In this pocket-sized pamphlet, Dr. Bernardo offers a first-hand account of his rescue work. The pamphlet explains how Bernardo justifiably kidnapped two young sisters, ages five and seven, as well as their sickly brother from the infamous Mother Brown, a woman who took in unwanted children only to exploit their labor. Sadly, the young boy died after a few months. Bernardo then decided to ship the remaining children overseas so they might escape the alleged negative influence of poor relatives. In real life, Dr. Bernardo claimed to have kidnapped as many as 47 children from their families. His tactics eventually resulted in three custody cases, all of which reached high court in 1899. We've only just glossed this very dense and sad history of writing on the Victoria migration schemes, but if you will bear with us for just a few more minutes, we want to close our talk with a couple of slides with fiction from this period featuring Canadian home children. Some of these authors were sympathetic to the children and saw the migration scheme as a reasonable solution. Others were more cruel or distrusting of these young migrants. For this exhibition, Jordan Library also purchased this stunning copy of R.M. Ballantyne's Dusty Diamonds, famed author of adventure fiction like Coral Island, as Alicia mentioned earlier. Ballantyne was clearly a fan of Mariah Rye and Annie McPherson. Dusty Diamonds reads as promotional literature for the women's migration schemes. There are several scenes in the text where characters explicitly praise Rye and McPherson's rescue charities. Both child protagonists, Tim Lumpy and Bobby Frog, are eventually taken in by McPherson's beehive, as it's called, and then sent abroad to a new life in Canada. Dusty Diamonds presents Canada as a safe haven where these slum children can finally enjoy a happy childhood. And here on the right, you have the frontispiece from the book. Read from the bottom to the top, the frontispiece depicts the child's rescue from the dirty and dangerous slum at the bottom to his happy placement on a Canadian farm in the middle. And then finally that happy childhood with everything from winter sports and country games. The library also acquired for us Hespa Stretton's Lost Jip. In Lost Jip, evangelical author Stretton helped popularize the idea of migration to the colony as a solution for urban poverty. The novel follows Sandy's search for his lost sister, Gypsy, shortened to Jip, in the streets of London. During his search, he's taken in by Johnny Shafto and his family who teach Sandy about God and Jesus. Sandy eventually finds his sister among child immigrants going to Canada. Mrs. Murray's home in the novel reads as a thinly veiled reference to Annie McPherson's home of industry. And ultimately, the whole Shafto family emigrates to Canada with Sandy and Jip. 
And the frontispiece here on the right shows Mrs. Shafta weeping as she sees Sandy wearing her dying son Johnny's Sunday clothes. And Sandy becomes a kind of adopted son to Mrs. and Mr. Shafto after Johnny's death. We also wanted to think about how Canadian authors responded to the home children. Meanwhile, back in Canada, the response to the home children was somewhat mixed. Some authors, like L.M. Montgomery, used their fiction to paint a rather unflattering picture of the young migrants. In an early scene, Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert discuss taking on an orphan boy to assist with farm labor. However, Marilla's quick insistence that she does not want a Bernardo boy, as she puts it, taps into emergent Canadian prejudices toward the home children. And this is from the novel. At first, Matthew suggested getting a Bernardo boy, but I said, no, flat to that. They may be all right. I'm not saying they're not, but no London street Arabs for me, I said, end quote. Montgomery's popular Canadian novel is ultimately sympathetic in its overall treatment of the orphaned Anne, yet scenes such as this suggest that Canadian sympathies were often limited. Conversely, Indigenous author Pauline Johnson offers a very sympathetic account in her short story, Bernardo Boy, on the young home child driven by economic desperation to migrate to Canada. Johnson had seen firsthand the horrors of the London slums during her literary tour in England. She was deeply affected by the poverty she witnessed there and thus wrote the sympathetic account of a young Bernardo boy named Buck, who's taken in by a great surgeon upon the urging of his daughter, Connie. The main plot of the story concerns Buck's attempts to prove his gratitude to his Canadian family. His chance comes when he single-handedly stops two thieves from robbing the family's home. And while recounting events to the police, the surgeon, quote, looked at Buck as if he saw him for the first time, end quote, and then proudly exclaims, he's our boy, he's my boy, and promises henceforth to send his adopted son to college the following year. We also wanted to acknowledge Queen's connection to this history. Though an exception to the literary angle of this final section, I also want to make a quick reference to the writings of both C.K. Clark and Clifford Crawley. I would be remiss not to mention these two men because of their direct connection to Queen's, my institution, and their university's role in propagating a certain vision of the home child's and the home child's place in Canada. Clark was a professor of psychiatry at Queen's University between 1895 to 1905 and is known as the founder of the mental hygiene movement, as it was called in Canada, a kind of eugenic approach to mental illness. Clark was a vocal critic of the home child migration scheme and his medical theories eventually played an instrumental role in closing Canada's borders to these young migrants. For example, in an 1895 lecture given to students at Queen's University, Dr. C.K. Clark warned of the, quote, problems of hereditary, as he called it, given that, and then another quote, in Canada, we are deliberately adding to our population hundreds of children bearing all the stigmata of physical and mental degeneracy, end quote. In 1896, Clark joined with the National Council of Women and the Medical Superintendents of Asylums in London and Hamilton, Ontario, in their collective call for an inquiry into the effects of child migration schemes upon Canadian mental hygiene. On the other hand, we have Bernardo Boy, an opera in two acts by Clifford Crawley, former Queen's professor an opera which highlights the important and even positive legacy of these home children in Canada, their service in the war, for example. Music for the opera was composed by Queen's professor Clifford Crawley and the libretto by Canadian poet and essayist David Helwig. The opera premiered in Kingston in 1982 and was a proud community project with contributions from local actors and musicians. The story, is narrated by Albert Ashby, an old man recounting how, in his early childhood, his mother's early death left him and his brother to fend for themselves on the streets of London, 
until they were taken in by Dr. Bernardo. And at the end of the first act, Bernardo sees the boys off at the Liverpool docks bound for a new life in Canada. Upon arrival in this new country, the boys are separated and mistreated by their Canadian guardians. Both serve in World War I, but only Albert survives. And after the war, Albert works on the Canadian railroads and retires with a small pension. One ultimately hopes that through works like Bernardo Boy and Opera, Queen's University might align itself with a better or rather more positive and indeed accurate history of the home child in Canada, thereby undoing some of the harm perpetrated by past figures like Collard. Finally, we want to conclude our presentation the same way we began, with the real life home child. We want to leave you with this final image of real life Bernardo boy, Frederick Edwards, who is the subject of the installation by Case 5. He was only a toddler of about four years old when he was admitted into the Rescue Society and then sent abroad at nine years old for a new life of work in Canada. Frederick would go on to work at at least two farms in Canada. Then at 21 years old, upon gaining independence, he wrote to the Bernardo Society asking for his accumulated earnings over the past few years. Frederick's before and after photographs are to be expected in such histories. These images, which were usually staged and directed, would be used as propaganda or so-called success stories to solicit financial support for the organization. But many home children like Frederick are now getting the last word, so to speak. For many home children leave behind them family and friends who remember their stories. Family members like Frederick's grandson, Brendan, who helped us curate this exhibit. It is our honor to listen to and to learn from these stories of the home children in Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much.